so you said that uh, m- most things that happened with the OGL did not surprise you. Yeah. Uh, there were a few things that did, but you said yeah. most things didn't surprise you. But in Bob's dissertation, when he's documenting the history of the OGL, he does make a hard, he makes a hard break between the intended use of the OGL in conjunction with the D20 license, which we have not, and the YouTube community talk general, not talked that yeah. much about at all. So we yeah. can talk about that. But he's, yeah. he makes a clear uh, epic kind of distinction, epic distinction between use as intended and then a realization that, hey, we can use the OGL without the D20 license and create our own games. Do you want to talk about the relationship between the OGL and the D20 license and what was being thought of at that time? And uh, was this a, was that something a surprise? That Was that break as big a break for you as it seems like uh bob yeah. implies it is in his history when he was documenting it if that okay makes sense. So l- let's let's talk about the d20 trademark system trademark license the stl there's too many acronyms in this conversation so i'll just call it the d20 trademark okay um okay so the open gaming license the ogl it prohibits you from using product identity unless you have the explicit permission of the owner of the product identity Product identity is anything that the person who uses the OGL says it is. And the intention was to allow you to clearly indicate all kinds of things that are brands and trademarks and intellectual property that you do not want to have become enmeshed with the open game content uh, requirements of the open gaming license. So that's how you can make the One Ring role-playing game, which uses the game mechanics from 5th edition and the world of J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Obviously, you can't license Sauron and Gandalf and the One Ring to anybody who wants to use it forever for free. That's impossible. The Tolkien estate would never stand for that. The open gaming license is unique in the open source world in that it envisions the idea that you will mix open content and closed content in the same work in a way that allows people to both understand what is open and understand what is closed. That is something that most open source computer licenses don't do. The LGPL, the quote unquote lesser um, general public license from the Free Software Foundation is designed to do half of that. It's designed to allow you to mix closed source and open source projects while forcing you to identify what part of it is open source. But it doesn't say anything about the closed source. The open gaming license deals with both at the same time. So that's important. In the United States, it is legal to indicate compatibility with a trademark if you are actually compatible with the trademark. It's legal. So under long-standing law, I could write a product and say, this product is compatible with Dungeons & Dragons, Mm -hmm. if it was compatible with Dungeons & Dragons. The OGL says you can't do that because Wizards of the Coast has identified Dungeons & Dragons as product identity. If you want to, to indicate compatibility with it, you need their permission. And Wizards isn't giving you that permission. Well, we did something in addition to the OGL, which was called the D20 system trademark license. And the purpose of that was to create a brand bridge between content licensed in the open gaming license and Dungeons and Dragons. And we didn't want to create a licensing regime for the trademarks of Dungeons and Dragons. For some of the reasons we talked about earlier about dealing with content that is awful and that you don't want to touch. We didn't want somebody to publish the Dungeons and Dragons book of racism or the Dungeons and Dragons book of fascism. Like we didn't want that. But we did want to be able, for people to be able to connect the work that they had done with open gaming content to D&D. So we created a brand out of nothing in the middle called the D20 system. And we made a little logo for the D20 system. And we said, if you follow these rules and accept this license, the D20 system trademark license, You can use this trademark on your products that have open game content in them. And we will put that same logo on the D20 products that we're publishing, like Dungeons and Dragons. So if somebody goes into a store and sees that D20 logo, they're going to have some assumption that there's a relationship between the thing that you published and Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. But nobody has to say compatible with Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. They just have to say they're compatible with the D20 system. That worked great. Like, it solved a lot of problems. We never had an issue with the press contacting us and saying, oh my God, I can't believe you're involved with this horrible, awful thing. And it was very clear to most consumers what that D20 logo meant soon after it became public. 
and they figured it out. You didn't have to make a separate one yep. and try to figure yep. out how to make them look similar. And exactly. Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of history between the D20 trademark. It only lasted for about five years. I'm not exactly sure when Wizards finally ended the trademark license, but it, it was a limited time thing. It served its purpose, I think. Um, and it's it's a story as interesting in some ways as the whole open gaming license. And, and maybe when this kerfluffle is all done, we'll talk about that at some point because it's interesting. But it isn't really relevant to the question of can the open gaming license be used with other games? So now I want to go back to that point. When we were developing that license, there were already open source licenses being used for tabletop role-playing games. The Fudge game was created by a guy named Stephen O'Sullivan. And he wrote a license that was like an open source license for Fudge. In my opinion, that license had an issue. And the issue was that you had to send him copies of your work and he would pre-approve them before you could indicate that they had been put before you could publish them and indicate they were compatible with fudge. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but I don't feel like it's true to the spirit of open source, which is there shouldn't be reviews and approvals. It also would be impossible for Wizards of the Coast to use because we would never be able to review and approve all the stuff that potentially could come down the pipe. But that license existed long before the open gaming license. When we announced we were doing the open gaming license, but before we had published the first draft of it, another company called Dominion Games, which was publishing a fantasy role-playing game, rushed ahead, wrote their own license, and published their game with that license. So there was a Dominion Games license available for people to look at that was being used as the licensing engine for a role-playing game before the open gaming license was used to license Dungeons & Dragons. It didn't get a lot of traction, but it did exist. There were plenty of people who wanted to use various open source software licenses for role-playing game products, and they tried. Uh, the Apache license and the BSD license, which are open source software license you can look into, are pretty generic, and they don't really have to be used with software. The GPL and the LGPL are pretty software specific. They could probably be used for anything, but they're very software specific. Um, so there were attempts to do this. And as soon as we started talking about doing the open gaming license, there was a lot of buzz, a lot of discussion about how this can be done, what should the license terms be? Like, there's lots of people that were trying to do it, right? There was a lot of, we're going to go and do our own license. It's going to be awesome. So there was a ton of people who had that idea. So it was obvious from the very beginning that the open gaming license, in order to be fit for purpose, could not be a license for Dungeons & Dragons. It had to be a license for open gaming in general because it was obvious that there was a demand for this type of system, this licensing regime. And that if we did a good job, and if the content we licensed with it, Dungeons and Dragons, was sufficient to kickstart an actual thriving community of users of that open game content, there would, all, obviously, there would be other games that use the same license. There would be new trees in the forest. And there were very quickly. Like, I'm not sure what the very first game is that was released under the open game license that was not a derivative of the Dungeons and Dragons system reference document, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it took less than six months. Like, it was from the get-go. It was obvious it was gonna happen. And when we were creating those licenses, I ran a mailing list. I, I created this entity called the Open Gaming Foundation, which is, it doesn't, it's not a corporation, it's just, a, it's just an idea, it's a website. And the Open Gaming Foundation operated a mailing list called OGFL and OGFD20L. OGFL was for discussions of the Open Gaming License and OGFD20L was for discussions of the system trademark license for the D20 logo. The participants of OGFL who are talking about the open gaming license had lots of time to talk about how to do it, what they wanted, what kind of terms were acceptable, unacceptable, what language should be used, all the things Wizards of the Coast should have done if they wanted to revise the license. And there were people on that list who were talking about doing their own games under that license from almost the very first day. So it, I will tell you, as the guy who was there, it was absolutely always intended to be a license for more than just Dungeons and Dragons. No question. And it was very quickly. Well, so that is very interesting to me because I remember seeing all the D20 modules and stuff like that. I remember all of that, that time when all of a sudden they were everywhere and then, okay, then it wasn't. And then the idea that, okay, they come later. But I think it's really interesting to know that right away, people were using that and you were anticipating whole new games to be built from that and knew that was going to happen. So yep. th there might've been a she C, C shift in terms of the volume of publishing, but yes. that genesis of the idea wasn't something that three years later, somebody went, Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's accurate. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the actual 
execution of doing it trailed the idea of doing it by quite a bit, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, it takes a little bit more to develop the whole system, too. Yeah. So, I mean, well, if, if there was... To see if it was going to work. I mean, who blames you? Like, you're going to take your life's work, your new role-playing game, and just risk it? Why? Wait and find out. And they did. Yeah. 